and we will be recording this panel in one second. Okay, we are good to go. Hello, everyone. Welcome, dear speakers of IDL. And welcome everyone else who's watching us. Uh, this is LMBA's conference 2021, day two of two of the synchronous virtual content. My name is Brenda Munoz, and I am happy to welcome you to the IDL session. This is titled uh, International Dramaturgy Lab, Connecting Dramaturgs Across Borders. And this panel will be presented in English, mostly. Uh, but uh, remember that we do have oral simultaneous interpretation if you need to do that. You can download the app on your phones or gadgets or also connect to your desktop now. Um, buenos días a todos, viéndonos desde algún país que hable español. Eh, mi nombre es Brenda Muñoz, soy la coordinadora de este congreso, el MBA 2021. Hoy es el segundo día del de contenido virtual. Y este panel es Laboratorio Interna Internacional de Dramaturgismo Conectando Dramaturgistas a Través de las Fronteras, que será presentado en inglés, pero tenemos interpretación oral simultánea para todos los que lo necesiten. Eh, pueden descargar Web Switcher Pro y el token de acceso está en el chat box. Si tienen preguntas, también las, puedes, las pueden enviar por el chat o nuestras redes sociales. Y... Hannah, I leave this panel to you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And um, lovely to be here um, at the conference. We have been aiming for this day um, for a year. Just lovely. Um, I actually just want to start with um, a quote from one of the ideal participants who shared a poem. Uh, it's uh, Linda Rosario's poem. poem and, she, and she writes, did we cross the border or did the border cross us? Which I think is a brilliant way into this uh, panel. So uh, my name is Hannah Sletne. I am Swedish. I work in English. I live in Northern Ireland as part of the UK, but on the island of Ireland. Um, I am a dramaturg and I have dramaturged and facilitated artist processes for over 25 years. Nearly for as long as that, I have dreamed of a project like the one we're talking about today, connecting dramaturgs across borders, specialism experiences, theatre traditions, languages and cultures. Uh, the, the International Dramaturgy Lab was born out of the collision between that deep-rooted dream and the pandemic, the cancellation of last year's conference, which opened up a new space. So in this session, the steering group of the IDL will share with you how we fill that space. Uh, the process of creating and facilitating the IDL, balancing between structure and leaving things open. And of course, what happened in that space? What do dramaturgs get up to when you give them that space to connect, reflect, make and think? Uh, before we go into what happened across the project, I want to pose a question to you all, because the IDL is all of ours, whether you participated this time or not. Um, so the question is really, what would you want from an international professional development project? What are your needs as a dramaturg? Are you, uh, as you listen to the presentation, I would love you to consider that um, so we can have a discussion about the future of projects like these. So, to the International Dramaturgy Lab. I hope you uh, managed to catch some of the short videos on the IDL platform that introduces the partner organizations. Uh, I represent the Dramaturgs Network in the UK, but we also have LMDA Mexico, US and Canada, uh, the FENS, which is an international organization, the Danish Dramaturgs Network and STUD, the Finnish Directors and Dramaturgs Union. So that's the organization, partner organizations. The steering group is made up, made up of about two people from each organization uh, with some overlap. And we have become a little mini ideal project 
uh, in our own right in figuring out how to to do this along the way. And uh, the main thing I'm going to say to introduce my colleagues, I will introduce them in a, shortly, but I just want to say that these guys in this steering group are the most reliable, competent, inspiring, brilliant bunch of dramaturgs, uh, the best people that you want to have on your team when you do something like this. So in this project, we started with an open question. What does it mean to work dramaturgically across borders? I think it was Jonathan Meth from the FENS who formulated the question very early on. And we're going to talk about how we managed to get 90 odd people uh, involved uh, and how we divide them up into 14 groups. That's what we started off with. And all of these groups, including the steering group, quickly had to contend with the challenges of multiple time zones, the centrifugal pull of English as a language, and therefore also cultural context and many, many other things. But I will hand over to my fabulous uh, colleagues on the steering group, uh, who all will focus on a particular aspect of the project and what we have learned from it. So I will first pass on to Laurel Green, who here is representing LMDA Canada. Thanks, Hannah, and thank you for your kind words. My name is Laurel Green. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm speaking to you this morning from the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Lekwungen speaking nations, now known as the Songhees and Esquimo nations in Victoria, British Columbia. I want to take a moment to acknowledge that the digital tools we're using today aren't available in many rural or indigenous communities and that technology has a continuous impact on our land and waterways. I want to be mindful and make shared use of our time together. Thanks so much for having me. I'm a white woman in my 30s with shoulder length brown hair, bangs and turquoise glasses. I'm speaking to you from my computer desk with a bookshelf behind me. I'm wearing a black shirt. I will try to speak slowly and clearly, and I want to give a big thanks to our conference interpreters and all of the volunteers. I'll be sharing my perspective with you today as a member of the IDL Steering Committee, a member of LMDA Canada, and an artist dramaturg who was part of one of the L IDL groups. I'm going to be focusing on the digital tools that were used for collaboration and creation throughout the project. I really want to take a moment to uplift all of the incredible work of my colleagues, both here on the steering committee, as well as all of the artists that made up the 90 odd IDL participants, the 14 groups Hannah spoke about, a two day context showing of projects that happened in February, and now 11 digital artifacts, which have been shared on the LMDA conference portal. So much deep, generous, innovative collaboration so much growth in our digital literacy as dramaturgs across the sector, across time zones from week to week, month to month, as theaters closed, as shows were canceled, as the world stopped for over a year, we met each other at IDL, hopping from digital platform to digital platform, busting any assumption that dramaturgs are only analog creatures and dismantling preconceived notions about our role as creative drivers, innovators, and primary authors of our own stories. Our dramaturgical lines of inquiry connected us and took on new forms. So we're here today with a rich and rigorous library of resources, transmedial prototypes of emergent thinking that reflect the values, curiosities, practices, and unique obsessions of each IDL group. This is an archive of time spent together in community, ideating and creating, interrogating and evolving the future of our craft. Because as dramaturgs, our process is our product. IDL's invitation was to join a working group with no fixed agenda. The steering committee asked applicants to fill out a brief online form and indicate a few keywords to describe their interests. So I remember looking at the Airtable spreadsheet filled with this vocabulary of practice at an early steering committee meeting. We sat together in a Zoom, which was determined by a doodle poll, and we made a list of all this nomenclature in a Google Doc. We translated the words across all of the working languages of the committee. On a whim, I fed this very long list into an online word cloud generator, and we watched what, what emerged. So these keywords became the next round of invitation. 
to identify what fields of interest participants felt drawn to. And groups were made with catchy titles like movement plus somatics plus sports, social justice plus politics plus disability plus gender, sound plus hybrid plus immersive. It was a way to kickstart a conversation. The IDL committee sat carefully with our spreadsheets. We tried to ensure that each group had a cross section of membership, identities, experiences, and intersections of practice. Once assembled, these groups were connected and began their own independent collaborations. I've already named several digital collaborative tools used by the steering committee to assemble the IDL groups. And while the novelty of a doodle poll is long gone, I still rely on it to negotiate across time zones. There's a certain artfulness, I think, that can be appreciated about these administrative platforms and the bespoke dramaturgical algorithms that emerged during this curatorial process. In February, the IDL convened a sharing event called Context, a show and tell amongst the working groups. Over two days hosted on Zoom, it was the first time we shared space and got to peek into what others were busy with. Projects took a variety of collaborative forms from a jam board of seven things we would take to a de desert island, a mural board mapping dramaturgical cosmologies, a podcast series on dramaturgy, meaning making and storytelling with simultaneous translation, video collages, a laboratory of digital and transmedia workshop sessions, writing exercises, essay paragraphs, comparative play analyses, case studies, working models, drawings, sensory explorations, audio experiments, script fragments, explorations in AR and VR, and this is to name only a few. Projects developed with email, Zoom, Doodle, Google Docs, Google Translate, WhatsApp messages, phone calls. Groups worked synchronously and asynchronously, met when they could, paused when they needed to, and proceeded with care, moving at the speed of trust. These presentations were recorded, and they now provide us with an archive of that moment in time mid-collaboration, complete with saved Zoom chats and PowerPoint slide decks. This is a Google Drive living library of our emerging practices, which has really become the artist papers of our time. I'm curious to know how future dramaturgs will make meaning of these when digging them up out of an old laptop hard drive one day. And what will we make of them as a community when we look back one year from now? Catching a glimpse of the other projects galvanized the final stretch of the collaborations, which have culminated in the 11 digital artifacts available on the LMDA conference portal, plus one video that reflects and introduces all of the partner organizations. Here, the digital tools used to bring the groups together became the delivery mechanism for sharing their outputs of process, creation, discovery, and hold many, many questions. <laughs> So I want to give you a small teaser of each digital artifact, something that jumped out to me while visiting the mall and something that might entice or invite you to have a look if you haven't already. And to make this very meta, I'm gonna try sharing my screen with some screenshots from my engagement with each of the pieces. So stand by for it. There we go, starting screen share. So I'll begin with the mystery of Rachel Sinclair, a Zoom play with multilingual episodic structure that uses a range of theater tools, including scenographic virtual backgrounds, including these excellent watermelons, singing and archival images to travel from country to country through the drama. The Cocktail Hour Ninjas used their digital tools to create nonverbal interpretations of Ibsen's play, The Lady of the Sea from three continents, including silent film directions, football playback, playbooks, tango dance steps, and an emoji Twitter thread for each scene of action that was inspired by teen culture in Brazil. Disability access and dramaturgy collaged their Zoom sessions to share provocations to offer multi-audience, multi-channel access, challenging existing power structures and Anglo-centric disability models, confronting class and linguistic barriers. I'm especially interested in their discussion of sensory engagement through VR touch boxes and how the aesthetics of access can make work better for everyone and not assume a conversation with able-bodied audiences in digital space. Yes, I Wear Glasses too, seen on this card here, created a highly visual music video with their shared lens. They ask, how is gender related to culture and race? They share mood boards of inspiration 
femme makeup videos, personal expressions, and playful dance parties. Lost in Translation has launched a podcast series called Dramaturgs Through the Looking Glass to explore dramaturgy, make, meaning making, and storytelling outside theater. There will be between three to six episodes, each led by a pair from the group. So we'll stay tuned. An untitled group of collaborators shared their slide deck of expressions, poems they had written, excerpts from unwritten plays, dramaturgies of dance and friendship, and post-it notes filled with amazing unanswerable questions. Serendipity Strategies approached the oblique strategies through shared discussions and discoveries. And this group really asked the question of the past year, how much unknown are we willing to accept in a process? Time Zone for Seven shared their Groundworks for Taxonomy of Digital Theater Laboratory of Digital Workshops, exploring how virtuality replaces the physical as the space where the theatrical event is generated. Among other topics, they highlighted the poetics of Zoom and its public and private theatrical opportunity. Constellations, the group I was in, wove together our mapped dramaturgical cosmologies into a video, audio, and tour through our intricate gather space, a 2D video game style map where as an avatar, you can li literally run around inside our process, interact with references and journey between our locations to explore a new terrain. Translation between language and cultures provided an essay with insight into how the group members navigated their approaches to translation. Their Zoom meetings have now evolved into a practical experiment that will be tested post IDL. The Dramaturgy of Fragility group expressed their investigation in an arena content board as a resource to explore fragility whilst it was happening, to see what patterns emerge, asking, how are we going to heal and rebuild the sector? How can we serve and support a new generation of theater makers at risk of being lost? A provocation that resonated with me from this group was how technology can be used to bypass gatekeepers and empower ourselves to create. So I'm struck by how form and content are woven together in these outputs now available on the LMDA conference portal with English and Spanish subtitles. I'm struck by I'm struck by the interplay of media modalities and the deep work of digital placemaking that has taken place in these IDL groups using digital tools as social technologies to connect, communicate and create. Dramaturgs as cinematographers editors, designers, directors, content creators, interdisciplinary builders, connectors, thinkers. These digital platforms have become our meeting spaces, our studios, our workrooms, our space to imagine, our moments of stillness, our place to experiment, disrupt, challenge, and play. IDL gave dramaturgs the chance to lead art making and put our curiosities and visions for the future at the fore. As theaters restart, as we re-enter our dramaturgical rooms, as we pick up these roles again, I hope we will continue this liberated, process-led, generous, adventurous approach to collaboration, to be brave, try something new, to share our work and ourselves with each other. These are some new models for dramaturgy. I'll now pass it uh, back to Hannah and on to my other colleagues, and I look forward to further conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laurel, uh, what a, a tour of the whole sort of output. It's wonderful. Uh, now that output did not happen just by itself. So I wanted to go back and uh, um, to just look at uh, how we, the steering group, uh, navigated this uh, sort of uh, unknown uh, route for ourselves. And Christopher, um, uh, this project was pretty labor intensive and it required uh, a, a good team and we worked in relay and I would love to just hand over to you to reflect on the, the process at the, the start of the, the project. Yes. Hola, my name is uh, Christopher Spender and I am a Danish dramaturg working at an institution theater in Norway. Uh, I am a board member of organizations in Denmark and Norway fighting for the dramaturgs. I came into this process by a coincidence. 
because the Dramaturgs Network, uh, my English sister organization, had talked about an international project. And I volunteered to participate because connecting people cross borders, both theoretically and practically, is a huge interest of mine. I have been a part of the process primarily in the beginning, but due to severe illness in a close family, I have been out for a while. But now I'm back. So if this speech is not right on the spot, this is the reason why. I was put into a group uh, that needed to focus on how the formal participation and application process, process would be beneficial to, the, to first the participants around the world, but also to make it easier for the steering group to pair the applications. It was important for the group to be as inclusive as we could be. and also to outline a world of possibilities. No problem is too big, no solution is too small. The application process that you, the participants, went through in order to participate in this project and why you are here today, were thought out by my group. We came up with a system where you made five keywords for you to concentrate your focus, but also beneficial for us in pairing the groups. So if, for example, two people wrote the same keyword, it would be possible to make a match. Some of the rules served as guidelines of how to pair the groups, and it was important to spread out the participants in different areas of the world. In order to understand that the way I define and understand the methodology around dramaturgy are different everywhere and also should be. It is important to talk and to take time, the time that you need. Therefore, it was also important to follow up on different groups through the process. As I can see and uh, hear today, some fell apart and some new people came in. And for me, the process in that way has been dynamic, flexible, learningful and meaningful in huge connection to how the surrounding world are looking today. Thank you very much, um, Christopher. Christopher was also part of the team that um, Envisaged, envisaged how we were going to connect people in February uh, for the first on the, the uh, event that Laurel spoke about that we were getting people together. Um, uh, and it was great to have such a, a, a large steering group because we could break out in smaller groups and focus on different things, which was a, a, actually a, a big learning point along the way. Um, so, uh, the next thing I want to then focus on, because a part of this already, we have had many languages that we've talked about, and I think this was one of the biggest challenges. How do we collaborate on an equal footing across languages? And I'm going to pass on to um, our colleagues, uh, Martha uh, from uh, LMD in Mexico and Sarah, uh, from uh, the Dramaturgs Network and also representing the FENS here today, because uh, I know you've looked specifically at the language uh, aspect of this project. Gracias, Hannah. Hola, yo soy Marta Herrera Lazo, soy la orgullosísima representante de LMDA México en el Comité Directivo del Laboratorio Internacional de Dramaturgismo. El día de hoy les hablo desde la Ciudad de México, México Tenochtitlán, tierra de los pueblos originarios mixtecos, zapotecos, triquis, ñañús, mazaguas y nahuas. Soy mujer en mis 30, eh, de tez clara, pelo castaño con unos mechones blancos recogido en un chongo, ojos verdes, una blusa rosa pastel, aretes dorados largos y detrás de mí hay una pared gris clara. El día de hoy, eh, Sara Sigal y yo les vamos a hablar un poco sobre cómo operó la traducción, las lenguas, los lenguajes en procesos de el lead. Eh, voy a compartir una presentación 
para apoyar eh, lo que vamos a compartir con ustedes hoy. Eh, y es una presentación que no tiene más visuales que el mismo texto o las mismas palabras que estamos nosotros eh, compartiendo en el audio que hablamos. Entonces, traducción, lenguas y lenguajes en el Laboratorio Internacional de Dramaturgismo 2020-2021. Como ya explicaron un poco eh, nuestras y nuestros colegas, el comité directivo decidió tener comunicación bilingüe en español y en inglés con todos nuestros miembros del de Laboratorio Internacional. Y esto surge de dos cosas. Primero, en esa solicitud preguntamos en qué idiomas trabajan no es, eh, los, las, los solicitantes y las solicitantes, y hubo quienes mencionaban que únicamente hablaban en español o trabajaban en español, o español y otras lenguas, pero no inglés. Entonces, se volvió indispensable que toda nuestra comunicación oficial fuera en ambos idiomas. Y la segunda fue para generar una invitación a los grupos siempre, no solo al inicio del proyecto, pero cada vez que tenían que interactuar con el comité directivo, en poner atención a la diversidad de idiomas en sus procesos y en sus contenidos y que nuestros integrantes y nuestras integrantes de México y de otros lugares sintieran esa comodidad de decir yo puedo trabajar o partir de la base de mi lengua materna. Algunos de los contenidos que compartieron los grupos que están eh, disponibles en la página asincro en la parte asincrónica de la conferencia y altísimamente recomendables. Estos son algunos de los temas que surgieron en relación a, en estos contenidos, a eh, traducción y lenguas. ¿no? Lo primero, evidentemente, la comunicación no verbal, que esto se vincula mucho con cuerpos en movimiento y lenguaje corporal, que algunos grupos trataron esto muy dirigidamente con todos los retos que la comunicación digital tiene al respecto, muy interesante. También surgió el tema de la descripción de audio, eh, que, que se ejemplifica ¿no? cuando una describe eh, quién es, cómo se ve, todo lo que quienes no tienen acceso a la parte visual eh, necesitarían saber para poder entender de la mejor manera lo que se está compartiendo. ¿no? Eh, la importancia, el valor de los silencios fue algo recurrente también. Y en contraparte, el exceso de lenguajes, el exceso de, de, de lenguas, el exceso de información, que también hizo que los grupos tuviesen que discernir eh, más claramente qué se necesita, qué tanta información se necesita y en qué momentos. El tema de la incomodidad que siempre los múltiples lenguajes traen y eso es muy interesante. El tema de la lengua franca, en este caso inglés, en, en la mayor parte de los casos, y hubo grupos en donde eh, nadie hablaba inglés como su lengua materna, pero era la única manera de comunicarse y esos grupos hicieron un uso muy interesante del inglés como lengua franca y al mismo tiempo la dominancia o predominancia del lenguaje eh, en otros grupos y cómo se transitó esto. Aquí les comparto tres ejemplos que me parecieron fascinantes del uso del lenguaje y de la traducción en tres de los grupos. Eh, como ya nos platicó Laurel, el grupo del misterio de Rachel Sinclair es una, una representación en Zoom, una obra en Zoom, y que trata del tema de la desaparición de esta mujer y el tema de la desaparición de cuerpos en distintos contextos, violencia de género, etc. Pero en un momento se alterna entre muchas lenguas, algunas que yo entiendo, otras que yo no entiendo. Y de pronto me cayó el 20 y dije, claro, al alternar entre muchas lenguas, el sentido mismo aparece y desaparece dependiendo de cuántas de ellas entiendes. Y eso fue una dinámica que creo que capturó de una manera magnífica eh, la historia que se estaba contando. También ya se, una disculpa, ya se... Eh, mencionó a los Cocktail Hour Ninjas que repensaron a Ibsen en el lenguaje eh, de adolescentes brasileños traduciéndolo a emojis, eh, que también fue un ejercicio fascinante, me parece, porque no nada más te da eh, una noción de todo el espectro afectivo, y, sino que pues, de todas estas nuevas formas de, de, de comunicación que, que nos obligan a replantear cómo se cuenta una historia a partir de de ese espectro afectivo. 
Y por último, el grupo de traducción, eh, hay estos dos, estas dos prácticas, la traducción y el dramaturgismo, a veces se colapsan entre sí, se confunden, se, se usan, una se asume dentro de la otra, y creo que nos hace falta como dramaturgistas o como traductoras y traductores a veces detenernos y decir, a ver, ¿cómo es que estas dos prácticas se alimentan entre sí? ¿Cómo se asemejan y también cómo se distinguen? Y creo que el ejercicio que nos ofreció el grupo de traducción en este sentido es muy, muy valioso. Entonces, bueno, estas son algunas de las cositas, es nada más la punta del iceberg de lo que nos ofrece y nos ofrecen eh, los resultados de este trabajo en términos de traducción y lenguaje. Pero, eh, Sarah, if you want to take it from here, let me know when you need me to change, move from the different slides. Okay, thank you so much, Martha. Um, my name is Sarah Siegel. I am speaking to you from London. I am a Dramaturgs Network board member, in addition to being on the IDL organization um, committee. I'm also a member of the FENCE. Um, I am a white woman in my late 30s uh, with medium brown hair wearing lipstick, which is sort of a reddish orange color for the first time since the pandemic. Um, I'm wearing a, a crumpled gray dress because I've just gotten off an airplane a few days ago and have not yet unpacked, um, so excuse my appearance. So um, I'm going to weave in some of what Martha has just been talking about so beautifully about translation and how it's worked um, in this project. And she spoke about the macro and I'm going to speak about the micro. Um, so I will speak about language translation and collaboration within a working group. I was in the Lost in Translation podcast group and I worked with um, people who were based in the US, Canada, um, one person who was partly in Canada and partly in Colombia, Mexico, Scotland, and then in Germany. I was in the US and then the UK. Um, and we, uh, so I worked with Lewis Fender, Bruno Zamudio, Liam Rees, Daniela Antensia, and Cassidy Kep. And we worked across English and Spanish. Um, and here are some strategies that we employed. So our first um, decision was that all of our emails would be in English and Spanish. Um, and that really set the tone for the rest of the project. And for those of us who weren't as fluent or knew the other language at all, we made good use of Google Translate. And sometimes that led to hilarious mistakes, but it was fine. Um, we submitted all our work to the committee that we needed to send in in English and Spanish. Um, we conducted all of our Zoom meetings across both languages. The dominant language was English um, because it was a language that everyone spoke to some degree, but we did make use of both. And then we ended up making a podcast called Lost in Translation, and we made that in both English and Spanish, and I'll talk about that next. So next slide, please. Um, so, making the podcast, um, because we did so much discussion of our different dramaturgical practices in our different countries, and some of us had worked in translation, and what it was like to work on translation processes, we, dis we started a discussion around um, commonalities between dramaturgy, translation, meaning-making, how dramaturgy is meaning-making, making translation is meaning-making. Um, and so we decided that's what the podcast, we would make a podcast. We've made the first episode, we hope to make more, and we divided it into English and Spanish. So the first episode is about translation and the others will be a bit about language, a bit about meaning making, a bit about dramaturgy outside of theater and performance. Um, we actually be decided to begin in Spanish because it became so apparent to those of us from the Anglophone sphere that English is such a dominant language, we wanted to turn that on its head and start in Spanish. And it was conversational. We experimented. We kind of went back and forth. And we decided against having um, literal simultaneous translation because we didn't want to interrupt the flow. And we wanted to experiment with what is missed and what is gained and what you can get from context. And we use what we called linguistic bridges. 
So there were some people in the group who were bilingual and they would create bridges from English to Spanish so the other people could understand what was happening. But there were chunks that if you didn't speak both languages that you would miss. But we tried to make sure that like in our discussions we had as a group, we wanted to make sure everyone, all the listeners would get the general gist. Uh, next slide, please. And um, we there were some interesting lessons that we learned along the way just from this experimentation. Um, not everything has to be translated simultaneously and or entirely. Martha was talking about excesses of language. Um, maybe you don't need to hear everything. Um, maybe you don't need to understand everything. Um, context and body language and facial expressions can be really useful aids, especially if you're live or you're on Zoom and you can see each other. Sometimes some one of us would get something even if we didn't speak the other person's language and we would laugh or make a face and then they would laugh. Um, a lot of it, you could kind of piece things together because we were all familiar with the context of performance and theater and dramaturgy. And so you go, okay, I think from my own knowledge, I think I know what that person's talking about. And that was quite nice. And again, I sort of mentioned this in the previous slide, but for those of us who exist in the Anglophone world, we were more aware of working in two languages and living in that uncertainty and living in the shadow of, oh, I don't know what that person is saying, of our own privilege of living in the Anglophone sphere and the dominance of English that we just assume when we travel everywhere we go, everyone we speak English or things will be translated for us. And it was nice in a way to be on the back foot um, for, I, for instance, I don't speak Spanish and it was nice in a way to just give over to other people and say, I'll do my best to keep up. Um, and what this really was, was a collaborative approach to bilingual conversation. It was dramaturgical, but it was collaborative. And we were really um, found strategies for relying on each other in order to make something together. And it was a really wonderful experience. Um, thank you, everybody. That's my half of the presentation. Thank you so much, um, Sarah and Martha. Uh, for anyone who hasn't listened to the podcast, I really recommend it for all the lovely stuff that we've just heard from Sarah. But also, I think, I think um, that the first half of it is a is a probably a very good representation of a conversation that happened in many of the IDL groups. As you start to go, okay, how do we present? to the LMDA conference, what we have been doing, our conversations that have been meandering everywhere. How on earth do we shape this into something that is um, understandable and that we can, you know, and it's it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, little moment in, in that podcast. I, I absolutely love it. So I recommend that very strongly to everyone. Um, uh, there was, uh, yes, it was like the group that I was in, for example, we didn't have Spanish, but we had so many other languages between us, many of us having more than one. It was very interesting to see how we navigate that and also what if that means from a cultural point of view. And I think that all reminded us how it's so much more than just a language. Um, and I wanted to then maybe use that as um, a link into the next part of this, because not only did we uh, have to reflect on culture and the environment and the, that we were operating in uh, ourselves, but so much happened during this pandemic across the world that challenged us and made us reflect on uh, access, equality, culture, um, and all of those kind of things. So I, I'm going to hand over to Phaedra um, from LMDA US to reflect on this aspect of the project. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Hannah. Um, and as, as she said, I uh, my name is Phaedra Scott. I use she, her pronouns. 
Uh, I am based in the land of the Muncie Lenape. Uh, I also have some connectivity issues. So if I fall off, please someone let me know and I'll just repeat myself. Um, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the very often unacknowledged labor of uh, the African people who came over here as a part of the diaspora, who helped to create the nation of the United States and to and whose labor is actually a part of many of the buildings that I do my work in, including the building that I am in right now. Um, my like in terms of a physical description, uh, I'm a black woman in my late 30s or not late 30s, uh, late 20s, um, and I I, I have, I have uh, mid mid length uh, curly black hair. I wear glasses, um, and right now I am wearing. So we're hoping that we're going to get yes him. Oh, are you back? back? Yes. So we got Thank you your glasses. <laughs> okay, glasses, and I am wearing a pink shirt, a millennial pink shirt, is what I like to call it. Um, also, Juneteenth is tomorrow, so happy Juneteenth to anyone that's celebrating, um, myself included. But uh, I want to take a moment to talk about. Um, to kind of overview what my colleagues have already been saying about some of the general outputs with the IDL, including this decentering of the English language, as well as figuring out how to work across different time zones, different languages in general. Uh, but I think another kind of really awesome and really unexpected, but pleasantly so output of this has been um, dramaturgs developing friendships with people all across the world with other dramaturgs. Um, I found it so inspiring during our context meeting to hear some people just talking about, yeah, we meet weekly and sometimes we just dramatic pause. Um, hopefully we get her back. Thank you. Yay, I'll be okay, back. Cool. So I was talking about friendships, but then also about how um, really about having a project at the end, and that sometimes the project is the process itself, which means interrogating what dramaturgy means across different borders. Out what people think a dramaturg even is to other dramaturgs, um, as well as dramaturgs becoming creators um, and. You know, we talked about people who created podcasts, who created theatrical work, who are creating like almost language glossaries in terms of how can we talk about art making across different borders and how can we use those tools that we're learning from people all across the world in order to enrich our own practices and in order to really become a part of this global artistic community. I think what the pandemic has shown me is that we do very much live in a global society uh, and that it's a, that it's a part of our obligation as artists and as dramaturgs to kind of figure out well where does that put us where does that put the art that we are making and that's been a really wonderful output of this i think across um the many different languages many different countries many different people um, something else I wanted to mention was um, dramaturgs as leaders, dramaturgs as the people who are going to be spearheading many of these projects, who have spearheaded these projects, um, and using a model that's outside of a hierarchy, one that is really about um, seeing the other person that you're working with and working together. Uh, that's something that the steering committee has definitely done. Um, I just to give you like a microcosm of what that was like, uh, I found it really awesome to be able to rely on some other people. When things in our lives happened, it was nice to be able to like, okay, I cannot do this for the next like three weeks, but then someone else would always show up. Uh, and I think that's something that not only in the steering committee, but in the individual groups, we've been able to see and that there are so many different ways of working and learning. Um, and it's just so inspiring. It's making my heart warm even talking about it. Um, but I, I highly recommend checking out all of the presentations. Like there are so many with so many specifics that it's almost like it's impossible to say, say them all without spending like four hours doing so, uh, probably more than that. 
Um, but that's all I have for now. So thank you. And thanks for the technical difficulties. Thank you, Phaedra. Um, that's absolutely, I, I concur with everything that you're saying. And I think there's some wonderful uh, uh, sort of representations of, of um, of the conversations that people had, some groups were really focusing on what happened to them week to week, month to month during this pandemic, things that happened uh, in the world and just uh, picked that up and reflected on that. And again, just as uh, Feder is saying, strongly recommend you to go and, and, and look at all the uh, incredible um, uh, contributions in the, in the platform. Uh, now that was uh, we've sort of very much looked at how we created a network uh, as part of uh, the steering group and then wider and all these little satellite groups and connecting the partner organizations. But there's also been interest in what we are doing from uh, from outside, from theatres and from the industry. And uh, and that is another thing that, because I suppose we've been so busy focusing on running this project and see what would happen with it, that we have sort of, we're going to pick up on towards the end, the last phase of the project. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, David, uh, who is uh, representing Stu, the Finnish uh, Directors and Dramaturgs U Union to talk about this last, last phase and connect connections with the industry. Thank you, Hannah. Um, nice to meet you again, steering committee. Hi guys. And it's lovely to see such a, a wonderful, t warm turnout for this event. So um, thank you all for participating and making this happen. Um, as Hannah said, uh, yes, we have been working on a networking event. Um, I can talk a little bit about that. It's that during the process, while the groups were working together, um, some very um, professional houses in theatre internationally uh, started to demonstrate a growing interest in what the IDL participants were collaborating on. Um, so this is quite tricky for me because I, I'm a trustee of a board, um, which is the union of Finland's directors and dramaturgs, um, which is also part of a, a larger collaboration of a union called TEME. And uh, I, I need to give you some background to that because it's a trade union TEME. It stands for the Trade Union for Theatre and Media Finland. So what we do there is that we have uh, 5,100 members in Finland and uh, they consist of uh, people from theatre, dance, film and television production, as well as circus. So my background as a dramaturg coming from the UK um, after graduating from Central in London, I, I come to Finland and uh, I live here and start to align myself in the society and start to get work. And it, I have to say I've been very privileged in that way, um, but I have managed to learn on this journey that that privilege needs to be acknowledged. and. Uh, to echo the comments of my colleague Fedra, who I've learned an enormous amount of information along this journey. Um, when she's talking about the future leaders of theatre, I believe that this trade union that I represent here in Finland has actually addressed that particular issue by embracing the work that happens amongst dramaturgs, amongst directors, be it nationally or internationally, such as the International Dramaturgy Lab, and starts to bring it into a particular policy and fight for those kind of advantages for its members um, legally so that it would become part of law. So from this background, you can see that my interest in networking and bringing an industrial perspective to this process is, is quite strong. Um, I can't mention the houses that I've approached already um, but let's just say that I also work as, um, as a dramaturg for a production company, which is also a literary management agency. And in that context, it gives me um, 
um, a certain amount of ability to talk with uh, certain influential professionals across the world on a regular basis. Um, the work that has come to my attention so far from the groups is absolutely amazing. To see that we could start from a point where um, Hannah and, and Sarah, who approached me originally, um, started to talk about, well, we don't know what we're going to do. It's a laboratory. Um, this was really exciting. Um, to hear someone say that we don't know where we're going, it was so, so refreshing. We're, we're focusing on the process. This was repeated to me time and time again. And I, I really start to like that. Um, and now we're going in that vein, we can see from these presentations that these uh, groups have dedicatedly put together to share with you. You can see the outcome of following that particular methodology. Um, it's not necessarily to have a prescribed goal. And similarly, for the networking event, we're not going to have a prescribed goal for that either. But we can say it's going to happen in the autumn. And we can say that there is a number of prestigious theatres that are very interested in the work of these participants. But what we're not going to do is decide how this event is going to happen. That's going to be left to you and the participants and the industrial guests who will come together and discuss. So please do check your organization's websites and uh, do check in with us at the International Dramaturgy Lab because uh, I think you'll be very pleased to see the kind of networking event that we're putting together for you. Thank you. That's wonderful uh, and very exciting um, for uh, the next few months. Thank you so much, David. Um, so I want to say thank you to uh, my colleagues of the steering committee and I'm um, for for just trying to share with you the journey that we've all been on. And I also know uh, that there are a couple of participants from other ideal groups uh, that are on the call here that uh, we were going to call on uh, to, to come and talk um, to you a little bit about their groups. Um, so that's uh, Walter and Pamela. And so I'm going to call on you shortly. Um, and whilst uh, we hear from them, uh, before the Q&A, we're moving into the Q&A afterwards. So uh, as you formulate your thoughts, um, I just wanted to uh, sort of reflect uh, for a minute on what I feel that the project, this project has highlighted uh, and areas that could benefit from more focus and possibly more problem solving. I do think that actually just on a practical basis, it, it, translation tools um, uh, that can be used more in this kind of collaborative ongoing um, artistic uh, environment. They're just not there, which is why it was great uh, to hear how uh, Sarah and her group have sort of started to solve that. But I, I feel that there is there must be people out there who can look at that. The other one is obviously this was very a time uh, sort of intensive uh, project all done on volunteer basis, which is why we could keep it so open and could allow it to be its own thing, which was great. Um, but the challenge for the future is how do we uh, sort of create a project that fits in to these kind of ideas, but also to funding funders, structures and aims and objectives. Um, I, I think we have now cl collated evidence, uh, uh, fantastic evidence of what happens when you do let a process be open like this. So I hope that that can form a basis on how we do this in the future. Um, so it's yeah, the question about how we build on the IDL to provide more long term and flexible ways to create these dramaturgical spaces of exploration, nurture and growth spaces where we can be professional, our, allow our professional minds to be fra fragile, to ask the questions, to to try things out, to say the wrong things because we haven't formulated the thoughts yet. Um, 
stumble on the serendipitous, uh, to be lost in translation, and to be, um, to think big, uh, to think globally, and uh, and and just listen, and just be, and just to stop the world for a little while, without the pressure to produce. How do we harness the best from the idea for the future? So those are the things I would love to hear your thoughts about. But I wanted to see if we could hear from Walter first, who uh, was part of the team Arirayo, who uh, produced this wonderful play, uh, online play. Is Have we got Walter here? Hi, uh, I'm here. Great. <laughs> Hi, Anna. Hi, hello, everyone. And um, I'm Walter Byung-Hok Chun. I am a dramaturg from South Korea, and I'm currently based in Ithaca, New York, in the United States. Uh, thank you, all the organizations and the Idea Steering Committee for um, being this wonderful opportunity. As Hannah mentioned, I was in the group uh, called Arario, which is a word from the Korean folk song Arirang. And I was in the group with Davide Giovanzana in Finland, uh, Rachel Parrish in California, US, and Tanya Santos in Mexico. Um, so uh, just to share a little bit about our process, our, our the title of our process ended up as The Mystery of Rachel St. Clair, which is a play or performance text. Um, so when we first got together, we started sharing our interest in dramaturgy or what we would like to get out uh, out of this this wonderful opportunity um, across na across nations and even um, even continents. So what we, we we realized that we would like to create a performance text that um, that reflects all of us, our cultural backgrounds, and all the languages that that was that were in our group, which included English, Spanish, Korean, French, Danish, German, and Italian. And um, also a, a text that reflected the themes that we were interested in, which included multiplicity, mother tongues, the sonic quality of language, taste buds, excess, different versions of borders, and the slippery sense of time. So um, with that, uh, with those common interests in mind, um, we thought we would give each other writing prompts to get us started on what kind of a story emerges from all of our uh, interests and backgrounds. So I share just a few of the initial prompts um, that that um, we gave each other. Uh, write about a time that you had someone impose upon you ideas about your cultural identi identity and um, what you were supposed to be because of that, that were inaccurate or inaccurate to your lived experience. Choose a substance like water and write, create a praise of it in its three basic states as a solid, li liquid, and as gas. Um, please pre describe the three stages of self in words, image, video, or in any other possible expressions. The past self, who you were, who you thought you were, the present self, who you would think you are, and the future self, who you will be, would like to be, or are afraid to be. Describe these three stages about order um, and teach each teach each other something of your native tongue or culture, like how to cook a certain kind of food or speak an aspect of your language. Uh, so from these initial prompts, as we kept writing and sharing, there emerged a story about this person, Rachel Sinclair, who is a Canadian journalist and a creative writing teacher. She was working on an article about Mexican female journalists. She recently broke up with her boyfriend, and one day she eats eight watermelons each each in a distinctive manner, and um, then she disappears. So as dramaturgs, we ask the question, okay, what happened to her? And, uh, and how do we develop, how do we uh, further develop this story that came out from all of our backgrounds and inquiries? Um, so we, so far, it was a very open process to, um, to kind of liberate ourselves from from the border, so to speak, from our identities as we connect it and uh, and see what emerged. But now that we had a um, kind of foundation story, which we shared at the uh, event in February, now it was time for us to 
you know, refine, develop, and create this into a uh, in, into a, a piece and add, add some structure. So from then on, we gave each other more specific prompts um, or instructions such as, yes, this piece is a story with a plot and character. We are all ourselves and also a character in this story. Um, yes, uh, we, we asked some, some uh, dramaturgical questions. What happened to Rachel? Is it suicide, murder? Is she still alive? And we also um, explored these notions of being alive, disappearing in our own cultural backgrounds. Uh, how are we, each of us, Rachel Sinclair? What makes us part of her? And um, also we placed ourselves in the investigator role. So uh, as, our, as investigators, what is our relationship to Rachel? Um, so, so uh, as we were putting this piece together, uh, and as we were you know, writing scenes, adding our own language, and, and exploring what does it mean to, um, to have intercultural connection um, that is centered on a protagonist, a mysterious protagonist like this, uh, we gave ourselves the final prompt create a satisfying journey that reflects the questions we've explored, our cultural heritage, and our artistry. Um, so the piece that we ended up recording, which was about 16 minutes long with four scenes, uh, is the result of our uh, process um, of that, that lasted several months. And um, we met about every other week or every three weeks, uh, when, and we shared. and. Uh, and um, and 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 eventually had a version of a script that we recorded uh, with video images, with singing, with different languages, and we are excited to continue developing this piece um, together. Thank you. That's fantastic, Walter. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. That's it's wonderful to hear all those exciting questions that are being asked because we see the end result. It's absolutely lovely. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to now hear from uh, also Pamela, who worked in a very different group that focused not so much on making a creative um, sort of a project, but looking at dramaturgical sort of issues in around disability and access. Uh, have we got Pamela here? Yes, I can see her. I'll hand over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm coming to you from Dublin in Ireland, and my description is that I've strawberry blonde hair down to my shoulders. I'm wearing glasses. I'm a white woman. I have a top on with white, black and red stripes going horizontally across and um, some earbuds as well. So uh, it's lovely to be here. And the very first thing I want to do is to say thank you to the steering committees, Dramaturgs Network, LMDA and all the fence and all the groups uh, involved in putting this together because the timing was amazing during the middle of the pandemic. It felt like a safety net coming in to hold you in the middle of your practice. And I suppose the first thing when we came together in our group, so it's Katie O'Reilly, Marilyn Simard, um, Martin, and uh, Marx, Fetz, and myself, it was just that feeling of connection was the very first point. And we all worked um, as dramaturgs uh, at different points with artists of disability in creating new work. So there was kind of a meeting point straight away for us to talk about. And we were using English as our shared language to talk about uh, all these issues and things we had in common. So we did struggle, I have to say, with the time difference because we had UK time for two of us and Canadian time for um, Mark and Merlin, which meant that uh, we weren't connecting as much online maybe as we hoped. But, but what was useful with that was that we shared a lot of offline documentation so we could keep kind of uh, the intellectual conversation flowing and then come back and have the kind of uh, verbal things together, you know, and touch base together. So I guess the first point where we started from is that we were in the middle of a pandemic and practicing. And so that was tricky because we had to do this pivot that I think a lot of us have had to do in the middle of our practice and change what we do as dramaturgs in the room. 
So from my point of view, I was working with a mixed ability group and we would be working with um, some Augusta Boral and um, theater of the oppressed approaches in physical movement on the floor. And I would be collaborating in that sense in the room with an ensemble because there are people of different ability, different verbal abilities within that room of practice. And then coming out of that, because that was not allowed with COVID and the pandemic, we then shifted online. And so what do you do? Because now you're in a space, a verbal space and a visual space. So I have to say the group were extraordinarily excellent in being wonderfully a supportive sounding board for me to talk to about that at that time, because the pivot became into one about uh, translating. We're talking about languages and translating a lot, translating into um, images and graphs and uh, visual an awful lot of the kind of core principles of dramaturgy we might discuss when you're kind of structuring story in terms of people trying to create their own narrative. So uh, a lot of the work was becoming more demanding and also uh, rewarding, I would say at the same time. Marilyn, for example, was working with um, visually impaired people and how to create access to virtual technology, you know, VR goggles type work for the vis visually impaired. And of course, as we as a world moved into those virtual spaces a lot more, there was a lot more um, questions being asked of him about how that work was going, you know. So uh, Katie was amazing as well to talk to because uh, I think somebody mentioned earlier on about the um, aesthetics of access being incorporated into the work and into the processes and practice of dramaturgy. So Katie is hugely experienced in this field. She is herself a player of disability and has written many extraordinary plays for those who haven't um, come across her work. Um, Peeling, for example, would be a, a, a very well known one, I think, in the UK at least. Um, so again, to have that knowledge within the room about how you reinvent a practice at this particular moment from somebody who has been inventing access in practice for the last you know, 10 years uh, is just fantastic to have somebody go, don't give up, keep going, keep reinventing, um, which was wonderful. So uh, when, when you asked earlier on about the IDL and wants and needs, those were the needs in the room straight away, you know, that so the first few sessions weren't really anything about blue sky thinking or anything like that. They were very much of the moment of practice as we had these kind of exigencies to engage with, which perhaps <laughs> looking at some of the other presentations was a little different from other folk. But also as time passed and, you know, then we had answered some of those questions for ourselves, we did get to kind of expand our own thinking into sort of beyond barriers in a way. And what does that mean? Because the thinking around uh, disability and access um, is relatively new in my country. I know it's more advanced in the UK and there's a kind of a different conversation in, in the Americas as well, but it's also housed in particular types of language. And it's interesting when we're talking about translation and language. So we tend to have binary focus in this, the idea of ability or able bodied and then the disability. And so we got into some really interesting, just discursive conversations around the medical and the social models of disability and, and who does the inclusion and who does the exclusion, you know, and that those two things aren't as obvious as you might think. But also we had a couple of languages. We didn't actually have Spanish in the group, but we did have Merlin, who's uh, may, I was going to say a second language, but his main lang her main language sorry, is French. And then we were working through English and um, in Ireland, Lorime Gaelic Freshen and Yusajme and Shanga Shin in my other Freshen. So I also speak Irish and I also use that in work, in my own work, and I work bilingually. That's a different section of my practice. But what we discovered was that the language and the words for disability in both French and in Irish were different and had different connotations than in English. 
and so they were they don't have the exclusionary con, uh, context of difference in those languages and it made us question our own definitions of what what assumptions we were making in our own work and so in the wider context of IDL, I'd be very interested to ask that question of people's of other people's languages and how we can think beyond those uh, assumed understandings, you know, and um, uh, Pamela, I'm going to just because that's a very good question, <laughs> but we have four minutes left of the <laughs> session. <laughs> so, Absolutely, can be all. Uh, <laughs> yes, so I was just uh, thinking that is a, it is a brilliant question, and I know uh, having uh, sort of seen a lot of the material that that is a question that we have asked in nearly all directions uh you know like um between not only language but culture and all of those kind of things i i just to sort of um thank you so much for uh, uh, sharing uh your journey with us uh, pamela that's really interesting to see how utterly different from uh, the other from walter's uh, group uh and how you made it into what you needed it to be, which is exactly what we uh, aimed for. Um, I uh, am obviously not very clever because I'm not sure if I have figured out where any questions might have appeared from other people. So if someone um, is, are there any questions that has come in for us in for our mm -hmm. last few minutes? We have a, a couple of questions here. Um... A few people asked where they could find the podcast um, and if it was in the hub and uh, there's the answers in the chat that it's uh, in the group Lost in Translation and you know it's that one because it has a little audio icon on the right. And then um, the other question that I'm seeing here from Emily White, but somebody correct me if there are previous questions, is what is the future of IDL? Will there be opportunities for more dramaturgs to participate in future iterations of the lab? And this is the big question. <laughs> yeah, no, that I mean, that is the big question, because I think, to be honest, we are fairly exhausted now after a year of running this um, <laughs> uh, on a voluntary basis, but also very inspired and excited. But as I mentioned before, I think this is a discussion for us in a wider way within our own organizations and uh, uh, to continue as partner organizations that have this conversation, how do we facilitate this? How do we expand it into other parts of the, the world as well, other networks and colleagues? And how do we get the funding to run it uh, on a continual basis? Because, you know, it, it's incredibly uh, amazing, the outcomes from it. Um, so I think we have the evidence, but now it's a question of finding a route but again and i'm sorry we're running out of time here but please keep in contact uh with us um because any ideas any thoughts uh, uh about this you can send them to uh brian moore at the lmda or to me i'm hannah at dramaturgy.co.uk and then we will see if we can organize the continuation of this but for all the idl participants uh, who have been <laughs> part of this journey this year we have one more event for you um, and we shall let you know about that as we as we come up so thank you everyone to the on the panel thank you to the lmda for hosting us and thank you to all of you who came and thank you, Hannah, our fearless leader. Thank you for all, all the, the work and labor and, and follow up on this. Thank you.